So we can go to target five now. And this one is super interesting. Do you want to do target number five yourself before seeing the feedback? Then click the link in the description below to get your coordinate. This one is really interesting. You might want to take your time on this one. If you haven't watched any of these episodes yet, you want to start with episode one, where I give you some brief instructions on how to do a remote viewing session. But for the rest of you, pause this video now, click the link, do your session, and then keep playing to watch your very interesting feedback. So as we review the transcripts, we don't have to talk about the separate coordinates, but people can just know we're talking about how we ask them to describe the place and then describe what happened in this place. And because um, this is a method people can use and have used already for doing archaeology and other types of research, especially going back into the ancient times, when first you need to get closer to the place where you want to start digging. And then when you start digging, you get the evidence to back up what the viewers saw during their sessions. So this is sort of a light example or light introduction to that kind of work. Should we go to Angela first? Sure. Pretty good about this one. I felt certainly better than last week's with the number or any of the outbounder ones. The I got front loading on both. I felt you know, I, I felt like the front loading on the second one sent me into a bit of a possible AOL drive. And um, although I was kind of getting hints of the types of activity in the first one, so I, I feel like it, I was kind of heading in that direction anyway, but I could distinctly feel that I was getting pretty sucked into, a, you know, a, an AOL drive on the second one. So... So Angela had impressions initially like aisles and rows and a maze. And then on her page three, she has a lot of repeating rectangular structures, but on a curve or structures kind of in between what looks like a road. And she, well, she calls it narrow streets trail path and so I've, I've actually been to this place but it's been a couple decades and from what i remember it's surrounded by various trails to get to machu picchu but then once you're inside the complex um, in the modern day there are there are well-worn paths between buildings there are stone staircases up and down the hill um and I wonder what would it have been like at the time when people lived there? So at the very least, several hundred years ago, uh, were the paths more distinct? Were they better maintained probably? So that she wrote trail and path and narrow streets. I think she's definitely picking up on that quality here. I could have been anywhere in the universe. I could have been in a forest where there were no paths or no streets but here she is picking up on those qualities on this ancient location. She wrote that she was feeling hemmed in or she doesn't have options where to go. Movement in a pattern or prescribed route. Sense of openness above, but closed in at ground level. Sketches of maze, trail, narrow streets. Do you remember when you went to visit if you were just allowed to go anywhere or 
was it an organized tour where you all had to go in a single line? On the hike to get there, it was definitely a single file hiking. We hiked the Inca Trail. But once you're in the complex, it's pretty open that you don't want to just walk anywhere because there are some places where you could just fall off a ledge. <laughs> so you have to be careful in places like this. And also you don't want to do more damage than necessary as a tourist. So there are trails you keep to and marked areas with little plaques to describe different things. Um, so that there is this suggestion of walk this way, walk that way. That's definitely there. Although there are some open spaces as well, but I think she's picking up on that here. I love her page two of her second session where she says community maze-like paths interspersed with structures storage worship areas yeah and and the word kiva so that's kiva is an aspect of native americans in north america so here we're talking about indigenous people in south america so somehow maybe her consciousness is using one concept to bridge meaning to understand this better? Yes, because she does say later, ancient indigenous cultures, such as the Anastasi. Mm -hmm. So she wasn't quite sure who the people were, but in terms of ancient indigenous culture, she was correct. And she said, a place of spiritual quiet integrated into community, people, society, lived close to the earth and to nature and activities were a market trading outdoors, busy community at the time. And the other thing I thought was really interesting was she, and I believe some other viewers had some sparkly lights, twinkly bright lights overhead. Now I have no idea what those would be if they were stars or if there was some kind of energetics over the area. But this is again, possibly an example where we might be able to learn something maybe more esoteric about a target that we can't see with our physical eyes. What do you think of that? I, I had that thought too. I think by, by now, many people familiar with remote viewing know that the UFO topic comes into play. Viewers sometimes make contact on one level or another with that kind of phenomenon. And so in a place like this, high up in the Andes, and I know people from Peru who today have contact with UFOs, and they know people who their families lived in the mountains as herders for centuries who say that their family line has always had contact with UFOs. Um, so that it shows up on a transcript like this. I've seen UFOs show up on other transcripts. So I, I keep an open mind. I know for some people that's, it's kind of crossing the line, like that's too much and we can respect that that I've had, I've seen enough, I've experienced enough, and I know others have to say, we, we can leave room for the possibility that viewers are picking up on something, as you said, esoteric. That's a great way to put it. Something that's not out in the open, something that's hidden or difficult to see. And again, if, if she's the only one that has bright lights above the location, then we might just disregard it. But it'll be interesting to see if the other viewers also got something similar. And in that case, that might be telling us something that we just can't, we can't verify, but we want to keep an open mind to that they might be onto something that we just don't know about. Mm -hmm. Hey, so. maybe not, Angela. One of the things I noticed with a lot of the viewers is they refer 
to biologicals. And I know that that is a term that they are taught by their remote viewing instructors to use as like an overall term to describe life forms. But I did find in some of these that I really wish the people, the viewers would have gotten more specific when they say biologicals. Are they talking about humans? Are they talking about animals or some other kind of non-human uh, entity type of thing? But I would like to see more specific wording because I think sometimes they're playing it kind of safe by what they're reporting and not really sharing what they're really getting because they don't want to be wrong. Mm -hmm. What would you, how would you guide a student remote viewer if they came to you and said, I'm picking up on biological, what, what would you guide them to do next to get more specific? Well, it really depends. How did they get that to begin with? Did they have a sense of a person there, but they've just been taught to be careful because maybe a person could be a statue or what seems like a person, you know, could be a spirit or could be an animal. But I always say, no matter what you initially get, know there's something there, separate out what you think it might be and go explore it further, you know, move closer to it. Imagine you're touching it, look at it from the front or the side or the top, talk to it, but do further exploration. Don't just leave it there. And I would say that would be true if you have a sense that there's a person or you have a sense of that there's a shape or some kind of structure or some kind of object, don't just leave it, go and explore it more. And that's how you're going to be able to let go of your initial concept, some which will be right, some which will not be, and then get further information about it. Wow, that's great advice. Yeah, thank you. Should you coral next? Sure. I can say I was fascinated. Um, I was a bit put off in the beginning because I thought, oh my, oh my word, it's like I should do a timeline. And instead, I just did the target and it was very nice. I'll open it tomorrow. Bye. So Coral had a tunnel to the afterlife. Wow. <laughs> so there's a spiritual quality to it. Yeah. She had tunnel-like passageways. To the other side. Mm -hmm. She had further words like a rock arch death initiation. It was like secret gardens on the other side. There's the word protection, bordering valley, seed gardens. So there is, I think it's a valley next to it, and it's surrounded by terraces where they would grow potatoes and other vegetables um, to sustain them. And I know they had to actually bring in more food because there there's no way they could grow enough there, but there were a lot of terraces there. You can even see them now from overhead photography. Uh, so seed gardens, I think, is tuning into that notion of growing crops in the surrounding area. And pro it probably required protection, some form of defense from strangers. She wrote later on, this is used as a passage to a safe, quiet place where people are dwelling, where it is a bit warmer and where there is growth of edible, precious plants. This place is well maintained and well looked after as well as looked over and guarded. It feels powerful, contained and safe in a warm, high, I think she said reddish place. A warm, high, red place. Uh, yeah, it's tough to read. And what would you say the colors are here? What uh, What is the stone made? Yeah, of? so largely gray. There, and then the surrounding landscape is green and brown. 
Yeah, gray, green, and gray, green, and brown are basically how I describe it. And then blue, the sky overhead, it's beautiful blue at, at that altitude. It's really amazing. What I find interesting, and I don't know if this is a hit or a miss, but on page five of her transcript, she draws what looks like a person and she says large wrap like fur carrying something but just as an artist I think Coral does this beautiful job of drawing this person who she picked up in her consciousness and just the way some mediums draw the pictures of the the people in the spirit world that they're perceiving and it turns out to be accurate I wonder are we getting a picture here of someone who really lived in Machu Picchu a few hundred years ago. <laughs> I, I just think her artistic ability is, is really beautiful. This is the kind of thing someone could frame what she just drew here. Yeah, I agree. And I was looking over at her second session because she did two separate sessions on this. And she does have trees and sandy and rocky and hilly and large structure she said the land feels open dry crisp cool has water i don't know if there's water there actually is did you remember yeah, actually there's a little town right outside Machu Picchu called Aguas Calientes. And it's, that just means hot waters. And there are some hot springs there. And the Urubamba River runs right next to it. So there's a river at hot springs right next to this location. Because yeah, she said water, trees, open, dry, crisp. S some larger structures feel like they're in an open space with, with large lateral windows, wood, a green roof, and a front porch with reddish stony floor. She felt like this had an educational collective feeling. There are smaller, lighter structures outside further up. They feel dry, dusty. The area feels dry and dusty, circular area. And then she writes a green roof is interesting because a lot of these buildings, we see the stone outside indicating that the roofs were made out of wooden beams covered by some sort of thatch, probably. So a green roof connects with that natural, that quality of using thatch or leaves or something to cover the roof of the stony buildings. So definitely she's onto something with that. On her page two at the bottom under, I think it's AOL, she writes like Nazca lines and not the Nazca lines are in Peru where Machu Picchu is. Wow. So geographically, she's sort of getting, getting there where we are on the globe. She also says it feels like it had a ritualistic purpose. Mm -hmm. And she also mentions feels like ancient carved stone that has images and carvings. A lot of stone. On the bottom of her page six, she writes heritage site. So I don't know if it is a world heritage site. It probably is, but it's significant in that way. Well, and this speaks to something that can sometimes be a challenge with remote viewing targets such as this. So this is a location that is very ancient, but then it also has a modern characteristic of it being a tourist site where people are in present time are offering tours. There might be tour buses. There might be people holding cameras. So you're bringing in present time into the past and a lot of times remote viewers can pick up on both aspects and sometimes that can be confusing. Mm -hmm. It was confusing for me when I went there because I went with expectations that I would feel vibes, you know, I'd feel some sort of something spiritual and I got nothing. 
I got nothing. I was probably just picking up on all the tourists, you know? Yeah. Was it pretty crowded with tourists? Yeah. And uh, since we had hiked in for a few days beforehand, we had the advantage that we came down from the sun gate before sunrise. So we got to access the place before they opened the gates because a lot of people would take the train into town and spend the night and just walk in when the gates opened. So we were there before. And so from up above, we could take photographs without the whole area being filled with tourists because that would spoil the pictures big time. But as soon as the gates open, it was, it was bus loads of people filing in. So, Yeah. And even so buses, gates, these are things that wouldn't have been there in the past. So it can be really tricky. Now, maybe if you sent the viewers back into the past, which it seemed like with your second tasking, you did ask them to pick up on the original uh, characteristics of mm-hmm. the place. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that would be interesting to, for us to see if there was more about, and I believe that they were picking up in the second one, more about the ritual is, ritualistic and spiritual nature of the place Mm -hmm. yeah i think you're right and some of the other transcripts will see more of that so ellie next or this was without being front loaded um i saw mountains all around in the background then i saw some sort of material made from animals as I saw the material made from animals and the shape, I got an AOL TP type, and then it felt as if many people had lived there once. It felt like a, an old-fashioned reservation. And I saw the mountains were always visible. There was something with the mountains, and it felt like an old town. Then even a fort came into my my consciousness, which then, of course, tied into this vision of one of those places that you go to when you're a tourist and you, or maybe not even a tourist, you see the reservation, you see the saloons, you see the way that things used to look back in the day historically. So Ellie had mountains all around in the background and she had materials made from animals And I believe in your feedback video, there was an animal. Yeah, there was a Yama. Yama. (laughs) And so it's interesting that she mentioned animal. And she also was having some image of images of teepees. And she mentioned feels Native American here. So again, We can't say that she's correct about Native American, but the indigenous type of people, uh, that would would make sense. But, you know, this, this is always a little tricky with judging. Now, very lenient judges would say, oh, Native American, that's close enough. Mm -hmm. Uh, But us restrictive judges would say, no, this is not in America. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Well, I think it's important to be as specific as possible. Like with the other transcript where the Nazca line showed up, that would help me go, oh, we're, we're thinking South America at this point, but this doesn't have that quality. This could be anywhere in the North or South American continents. And if she writes Native American, that made me think United States or Canada instead of South America. Although technically Native American can mean North or South, but as a, as a guy from the United States, my mind thinks North America when I hear that phrase. So the more specific, the better. The only place where we can be flexible, I think, is if this was an associative remote viewing experiment and the alternate potential image was maybe of a bicycle race in France. So we would definitely know she was targeting the, the proper image instead of a bunch of bicycles in modern day France. And yeah, and if you think about where they, the viewers could have been given any location. So this could have very easily been a location of a city environment. So just to get native does 
make us think that she was at least having sight contact, that she did have some contact here. And I was also noticing her sketch while she did a sketch around her words. If you look at it, it is a nice depiction of how there's mountains and then the central area encircled within, nestled within the mountains. Mm -hmm. And she does say there's animals domesticated resides within um, some, this is natural and man-made. And, you know, at first when I saw man-made, I was thinking, well, I guess I tend to think of man-made as being more like metal, but these structures are very much man-made. They were made by men, right? Even though mm -hmm. they're made out of natural materials. And she picked up that they were natural and made from men and animals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's interesting. It can be quite specific when you combine two different qualities that you wouldn't normally assume go together, but you put them together. So it's accurate that way. She said the mountains were visible. So she knew that this target was not only of mountains, but that they were in the background. Mm -hmm. the, the one thing that's a little bit off is she writes snow and I don't know if it ever snows there. It might, but I, I, I don't know. And I wouldn't normally associate Machu Picchu was snow, but maybe it does. I'll have to check on that. Does it ever snow there? It got pretty cold on the hike in, cold and wet. So maybe it does snow once in a while. We'll see. Now, it seemed like she was thinking this was quite high up because she was getting she was asking, where's Pike's Peak? So she she was getting a sense of something very high up. Do you know what the elevation is? I don't remember. It is very high. It is challengingly high. I know that from the hike in and like breathing, it gets pretty difficult. So the altitude is an issue. This brings up an important issue with tasking though, is that Ellie, I'm pretty sure she knows that I live in Colorado and she mentions Pike, Pike's Peak, which is here in Colorado, just an hour and a half south of Denver where I am. And so if some part of her mind is thinking this could be a place in Colorado, maybe that's why it brought up Native American instead of something in South America that was sort of using a phrase that would be more descriptive of that instead. So there's a little bit of accidental front loading. Like if you know what part of the country your tasker lives in and you assume they're going to choose a target in their hometown that's going to play into it, right? Yes, quite a bit. I know my students know, for example, that I live in Oregon, right near a river. And so that will oftentimes enter into their transcripts. And it, it is a problem. And the a lot of times the viewers, they're very focused on wanting their project managers to to think they're doing a good job and approve of what they're doing. And anytime that I have that thought that does create even a telepathic connection, it creates a logical connection and it could be a problem. So if we were setting this up as a scientific project, we might not even want them to know who is creating the targets or who is tasking them, we might want to create levels of separation between those people to both help them avoid either the telepathic connection or the logical uh, inferences that are going to be made like this. Yeah. It'd be great if something like this became a like a TV show and whoever funded it, they had to fly the tasker to different parts of the world for truly unique and random targets, anonymous targets. That'd be great. <laughs> that the viewers would never imagine. Yeah. The be at. And if the viewers knew that you would be flown anywhere in the whole world, then that might take care of the assumption that it's going to be somewhere in the Colorado area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have Lena next. Okay. So I would say that this place has 
a lot of like history a lot of history but i also kept like when i was in this area i kept looking upward so there's something like looking up that is important to really see um so i would say that this place is 60 percent man-made 40 percent organic um i also felt like there's fra fragile things here but it could only break if you purposely break it so lena on her first page right away had mountains mm -hmm. and she had man-made and she had wind air in this area but the wind goes a certain direction. Interesting. It also says uh, soil, grass, moist ground sometimes. So that's to do with the crops they were growing. They had to have irrigation for the crops. She said it was stair-like, steps-like. She was seeing those repeating shapes and she draws what looks like some rough steps, not exactly perfectly uh, structured steps, but a little irregular. Yeah, I think one of the photos as the feedback is a photo of steps. And that is the thing about the stone. It has soft corners, rounded corners. This kind of has that feel to it. Yeah, she, she says lots of lines, fragile, as if you could break it. Man-made, she said 60% man-made, 40% organic. That's pretty interesting. So that uh, brings up the question again of when, when we're looking at stone architecture, it's natural materials, but human work put into it. So, yeah, she said hard material made of a material like cement, brown. Should we look at Carl's? Yeah. Hi, Sean and Deborah. So, this video, a lot of energetics, um, as mentioned, they were everywhere power, spiritual feeling, um, very divine, religious to a point. I have to say, that this next one by Carl from Machu Picchu is hands down my favorite transcript of all of these targets and all of the transcripts. I, I agree with you. Not only is it accurate in different ways, but it has this feel to it, this spiritual, mysterious quality to it that I think Machu Picchu is evocative of. So it has that deeper level of meaning to it, which is, it just adds that richness to a session. So right away from the start, he was having a sense of an Indian settlement. He had vast, open, man-made, hard, aged arch pattern, important structures, and you could tell that he was moving himself around the location. So he went up 10 meters and looked down. And then he was looking down from 100 meters up. And you could really see his session develop, especially as he moves along. On his page three, he has a sense of temples and they look like um, kind of pyramid structures very much steps he said I can't work out if I'm coming down or going up yeah I really like this drawing because this is reminiscent of, of actually Mayan temples that's what comes to mind for me but cer certainly Inca Maya Aztec temples have this pyramidal quality to them and so even though he had Native American on his first page, just like in the other transcript where Nazca lines showed up, bringing us down to South America, these temple drawings bring us back to South America too, in a strong way. And then on his next page, I thought those eyes were really interesting. He had this 
experience of feeling like he was being watched from a goddess type entity who's protecting the space. And he said, spiritual, iconic, protective and warning. And he had the word Aztec. Yeah, (laughs) this blew my mind when I saw it. It gave me chills actually. And I know remote viewers have reported in the past having that sense of when they're on a location that the people or whatever beings are there know that the viewer is there in consciousness. And sometimes they're okay with it. And sometimes they tell them to get out. (laughs) Or There's that feeling like, you don't belong here right now. Go away. And so here's Carl at this place. And he's feeling watched by this spiritual figure in a sense and it's just i want to know more you know it draws me in i want to <laughs> i want to have coffee with carl and sit down like what tell me more what was that like who was this being yeah and just the shape of those eyes with the circle between the eyes it gives you a sense of an a cultural that's not uh what you would typically see like with the the christian culture or something like that so Mm -hmm. and i thought he just did you could tell that he's going from all these viewpoints he's looking directly across and down now from 20 meters and then from 10 meters and i really felt like when you gave the viewers instructions for this one you told them if they were going to do a good job, they needed to take their time. And you could see on this one, Carl did take his time. You know, he's, I've known Carl for, for a while and he was already a good viewer before we met. And then we did training together and I've seen what he could do. And this is on par with what he really can do. And sometimes he can do this really quickly. Other times he does spend more time in his sessions and it really develops like we're seeing here. But I feel like everything came together for him in this session. And he really demonstrates what what, um, doing movement commands and just taking your time and being very detailed can can really do for you in a remote viewing session. Yeah, it's definitely impressive work. You know, on his third page, it takes us back to when you mentioned someone had talked about the lights up above because he's got bright, shining beams, arcs, electrified. What, what are the, where are these qualities coming from? You know, you wouldn't think this is coming from a stone building. Well, and on page four, it's interesting because he has, he draws people on steps Mm -hmm. and which of course the that's such a central target to this but then he also has something floating in the air it's on his page four he has an object floating in the air mechanical and natural and he says alien feeding sending receiving very interesting yeah is that a satellite or a spaceship or and he says he actually says alien (laughs) i mean we're laughing but i i think we're both kind of this is like a wow sort of thing it's not a joke it's it's definitely very interesting and provocative yeah now it's he has tunnels in a couple places would you say there's tunnels at Machu Picchu. I not that I know of. Not that I know of. But that doesn't mean that there aren't any there. Who knows? Maybe there are tunnels underneath this location and eventually they'll be discovered if they haven't already been. You know what? I just Googled it. Uh huh. There is a headline that says the new Inca Trail to Machu Picchu and a tunnel discovered. And then another headline says, in Machu Picchu, they found a new Incan trail and tunnel. It says, a tunnel almost five meters long stands out that goes through a rock in the Montana. 
It joins the area known as a place of the winds. This place is located at the back of the Machu Picchu mountain. So again, here we have a case where a remote viewer is actually teaching us something about a location that we didn't know, but we can confirm because other people figured it out. All right, Carl. (laughs) Yes, nice work. One of his final pages, there's hands holding a bowl that he drew. So this is more symbolic. Although I almost wondered if the the hands almost look like the shape of mountains with a circle in the middle of it. So I wasn't sure if, if he was trying to turn this symbolic or conceptual into what uh, how it actually is shaped. But he says offering and ritual. His summary says, from first viewing this target, I was plagued with energetics, lots of energy floating and hovering around me. Motions of turning, spinning, and various directions were happening regarding not only these energies, but with certain structures. Pyramid-type structures were seen, as were arc-type shapes and long channel-type objects with slimmer shoots coming from them. Steps or stair-like structures were seen, and these felt old and of a serious nature regarding their use or intended purpose. The structure can be seen from afar, Its purpose seems to be to connect or harvest energy and power from the sun or the sky, a connection on a higher realm. People congregate here to carry out something of importance or a higher purpose. It felt divine, spiritual, and sacred. The energetics of this place are overwhelming and everywhere. And then he went into viewpoints One, pyramid-type shapes of a triangular form were seen scattered around the open area. Two, a channel-type shape likened to a very large feather was viewed with what appeared to be a spear-type ball shape rolling down the channel, which was in the center. Arc-type shapes appeared with a tunnel-type shape. Biologicals were everywhere, motions of them going into and out of a large structure that felt ancient. They traveled up and down a stair-like structure, and everything had the feeling of being very serious. Beams of energy kept arcing out of certain objects, and the feeling was of the whole area being or becoming very powerful. Parallel type lines were shown throughout my session, and they were very regimented and formatted between equal lengths and tapering off into a pointed type shape. The circular type shape that I sketched several times felt like the sun, this being a strategic and important element of the whole thing that was going on. And he said that the biologicals, meaning people, all appeared to have dark hair. Even that's significant because if this, the location could have been somewhere in Northern Europe or, you know, in Scandinavia where there'd be a lot of blonde people, but here there would definitely all be black haired people. Very nice work, Carl. Carl. 